All right, so a couple of other logistics changes that you need to be aware of. So in just a couple minutes, we're going to go through Homework 4 Solution, and we're also going to talk about Lecture 4, which I posted into the <laughs> file section on the historical financial analysis. But there's going to be a change on the schedule. Change number one. On Wednesday's class, which will be September 27th, uh, there's not going to be a lecture, and you're going to basically have time, which will probably require Bloomberg, to work on homework five in lieu of the lecture, which will be due on Monday, the uh, 2nd of October. Okay, The midterm that was previously scheduled for the 2nd of October is being pushed back one week. So part A of the midterm is no longer next Monday. It'll be two Mondays away on October 9th. Part B midterm, which was going to be on October 9th, will be on October 16th. Right? Based on the fact that part A of the midterm is the economic statement conversion, and some of you had some challenges with that this week, I'm going to push everything back to give you time to practice more before you have to do it again for a big grade. Okay, so we'll do some more practice. Right? So again, changes. Homework 5, which was due in like late October after the two midterms, is now going to be due Monday, October 2nd. I'm making these changes on Elms. You'll see them accordingly. And I'm giving you class time on Wednesday, so there's no lecture, to work on homework 5. Since I'm giving you class time, then really, unless it's a really needy extension, no extensions. So you can't email me on Sunday and say, I don't have time to work on the assignment because I'm actually giving you class time on Wednesday to work on the assignment. Okay. Now, again, the midterms are going to be pushed back. So midterm part A is October 9th. Midterm part B, October 16th. Both midterms, open notes, open computer. Okay, I don't believe that the standard for grading should be how well you memorize things. And just because one person is a better at memorization than the other shouldn't get a better grade. Like in the real world, it's more important to understand it and get a correct answer, even if you look up the formula, than to forget the formula and then have that be penalized against you. Because I'd rather you not memorize I'd rather you not memorize the formula and get it right than memorize the formula and get it wrong. So in this class it's not about memorization. Open notes, open book, open computer. However, no collaboration. Okay, so this is honor code. You don't want to screw up your life because you screwed up the honor code. But basically you can't talk to or work with each other on an exam. You gotta do it yourself. All right? Yes. Is there so here's the other thing. I personally don't want to sit here and watch 45 of you for an hour and a half take your exam. Right? It's, it's not a productive use of either one of our times. So here's the way that the exams are going to work. If you haven't taken an exam on Elms before, you're going to take the exam on Elms. The exam will open up at the beginning of your class time. So this section starts at 2 o'clock. This section ends at 3.30. That's your window to take the exam, unless you have a, an accommodation that you previously talked to me about. But basically, you'll click on it, you'll have to submit it during that 90-minute window. Right? And it auto-submits when the window closes, so if you don't submit it, you get a zero. So you have to submit. Where you take the exam, I don't care. You want to take it in your dorm, you want to take it in the library, you want to take it at Starbucks, you want to take it at the beach, have fun. You just need an internet connection and a computer with Excel. Right? You won't need Bloomberg to do parts A or B, but basically you'll have to do it during the class time. It just doesn't have to be in this room. It can be in this room if you want it to be, but otherwise it doesn't have to be. So on October 9th, Part A, what will happen is the beginning of class time, you for the class that you registered, that's the other thing. If you're in a different section, you it's the exam is based on the section you're registered for. Okay, Because I have some people that are taking this section even though they're not registered for this section. So very important. You have to take the exam based on the section that you're registered for that 90-minute window. And then that's going to roll throughout the day. Okay? Same for Part A, same for Part B. Okay? Part A, pretty straightforward. It's going to look a lot like Homework 4. I'm just going to give you an Excel file. You're going to convert it. You're going to re-upload it. The only difference, you got 90 minutes. That's it. That's Part A. Okay? Now, to help you, I'm going to actually give you, this week, non-graded, what's called a practice midterm. Practice midterm, practice solution. I'm going to take a historical midterm where they have to do a conversion. I'm going to give you that to practice. That's the additional practice to help you for what's going on in two weeks. Part B is on anything. So anything in the book, 
anything in the lecture notes, anything we discussed in class, all theory. <clears throat> That's part B. Yes, 90 minutes. So for part B, is that going to be chapters 1 through 10? Everything that's been assigned up to that point. <clears throat> Primarily focused on what we've covered in class, but I don't distinguish between what's in the book and in the class, so therefore I can, great, I can ask you questions about either, because there's blend between the two. Yes? What's the format? Is it like multiple choice or short answer? Yes. Okay. Well, last year, last couple of years has been 9 to 11, combination short answer essay questions and multiple choice questions. But even though I hate the essay questions, and more, the TAs actually grade them, so I just feel bad for the TAs, because <laughs> they have to read what you write. <clears throat> but basically, essay questions are a better way to assess whether you know what the multiple guess. You guys can gain that. It's much harder to gain the essay questions. Okay, so mostly short answer. Right, other questions? All right, so today let's talk about homework four. So homework four was the economic statement conversion. So I'll just, I put the solution on Elms in the file section in the folder called homework four. So you're welcome to check that solution. Right? Now, and rather than redoing homework for all again, I'm just going to ask. So TFI, questions about the TFI? Any questions about the TFI? Pretty straightforward in the TFI? Okay. How about the TII? Any questions about the TII? Again, the way the TAs were instructed to grade this, each tab is 0.5 points. To get a correct answer, you must have a correct answer and balancing. If you have a correct answer but unbalancing, you get zero for the tab. So they're not giving you partial credits. So basically, that's what's going to be important. So questions about anything? Okay. <clears throat> important thing going forward with the TII is minority interest. <clears throat> basically, number one, it's an outflow, so it's a positive number. But generally, on an income statement, anything listed after tax has been paid, you don't want to double tax because that will cause you to have an incorrect statement. So the minority interest payments are an after tax number. So you don't have to tax affect those. And for TII, the income statement ends with net income. Okay? So even though dividends are on here, since they're not technically part of the income statement, you don't have to use those to balance TII. You will need those for TF or CFI, okay? which goes to statement number three. Here's CFI. I'm sure that based on the lack of questions, many of you probably got the TII and TFI, and if you struggled, you probably struggled with the CFI. So here is the balancing CFI. Okay. <clears throat> so again, a couple of tricks that you should have followed. The biggest trick would be on the financing or funds flow side. So first, remember that it's on the cash flow statement, it's interest, uh, sorry, dividends, not net income. <coughs> so just a second ago, I said you got to use net income to balance the TII. But when we look at the cash flow to investors, net income is not the cash flow. So we use dividends, not net income. The other trick that we talked about is that <coughs> you don't want to look at the change in retained earnings because a change in a non-cash account doesn't affect cash flow. So if you did either one of those two things, you would have never gotten your CFI to balance. And then the only other tricky part of the CFI is thinking through the sides. What's positive, what's negative, right? Based on experience, two areas that you might have struggled with. On the <coughs> first half of the statement, the operating and non-operating cash flows, the CFI, the new item on there that you should think about that could struggle with is change in excess cash. So let me just give you the way that I think about the change in excess cash as a metaphor, and hopefully it will help you as you think about that sign on a go-forward basis. So I like to think of operating cash as my checking account, and I like to think of excess cash as my Fidelity account, Fidelity Savings account. So here's the thing. I pay my bills out of my checking account, and I have direct deposits and other payments coming out of my checking account. So 
if I take money out of checking and I send it to Fidelity, I have less cash flow available to investors to pay my bills. Therefore, it's a negative to your CFI when you increase your excess cash. All right. If I take money out of Fidelity and I send it to my checking account, I have more cash to pay my bills out of my operating account. It's a positive to CFI in terms of the decreasing the excess cash. Adds to the cash available to be paid out. So that might help you. It's just kind of like a little metaphor I use as you think about the directionality of excess cash. The other one that you may have struggled with is the minority interest. Okay, So generally on this side of the statement, the funds flow side of the statement, any payouts are positive numbers. Any borrowings inflows are negative numbers. Okay, So practical example for minority interest. <clears throat> So I work with a construction engineering company called Lane Construction. And they're a subsidiary of a company called Cellini, about a 5 billion euro company based in Italy. But they're the North American subsidiary. And one of their projects that you might be familiar with is a project called the Purple Line. So they're one of the construction people to work on the Purple Line. Except they're not the prime contractor on the Purple Line. So what happens in these giant construction projects is you'll get a company like a Skanska or a Floor, and they will become the prime contractor. And they will hire other construction companies to work as subcontractors on these construction projects. And so a typical one, like the Purple Line, might be something, I don't know the exact details, but it usually is like this. Skanska or a Floor might take 60% ownership in the prime. So they win the bid, and they form a construction venture as part of this construction venture, they're the majority owner and controlling interest player of the construction as the prime. Then they'll bring in somebody like Elaine, and Lane will be a 20% owner of the construction contract. Right? Another one might be 20. So 60, 20, 20 adds up to 100%. So here's the point. They all kick in cash based on the percentage of ownership, and a company like a Skonsker Floor is going to then represent that 20 and 20 subcontractor interest as minority interest on the balance sheet to those minority players. But they're going to actually control the whole P&L, control the whole balance sheet. Okay. Now, let's say that the project over time makes money and they give cash distributions to the minority shareholders. Well, those are minority interest payments. Those are basically dividends to those minority shareholders because we made money on the construction project. If we have extra cash because we did better than schedule, those are going to be minority payments on the balance sheet because outside of the dividends, I'm going to reimburse you because you gave me more cash than we needed. So I will also have a change in the balance sheet, and those would be positive numbers if I actually reduce my minority interest by paying back the original principal. However, what is more common is the project's over budget. So there's a capital call, and everybody has to write a check to the joint venture. And at that point, it's a minority interest negative on the balance sheet back to the JV. Okay? So there's two things that could be happening in the real world with minority interest. One is the dividend payments to the minority shareholders that the majority company is responsible for. And that primarily comes from the fact that the IRS doesn't want to be tracking down companies for tax payments. So basically, the majority owner pays the taxes. And then after the taxes are paid, they then send the distribution of the dividend to the minority shareholder. And then there's accounting for the original contributions and any subsequent contributions or divestments outside of profits, dividends. And that's the minority interest change in the balance sheet. Again, if you're adding capital, it's a positive. If you're taking capital out, or sorry, if you're paying out capital, it's a positive. If you're adding capital to the joint venture, from a perspective of a Skanska or a floor, it's a negative. It's like borrowing debt. Okay. Hopefully that will help you as you think about CFI in the future. Any CFI questions outside of that? Okay. Everybody got CFI then? Yes. If you simplified, then that's okay, as long as you understand, because we're going to grade you on the totals, so as long as you understand what you're doing, you're welcome to simplify. 
Matter of fact, what I did here in the solution is I actually took the simplified gross investment and I broke it out. Because when we do analysis, seeing the individual categories will give us a little bit more information. So I actually gave you, instead of saying change in operating investment capital plus depreciation, these are the actual categories of gross investment that sum up to that amount. Right? Other questions? Yes. Uh, we didn't have to label like all, everything in the statements, right? As long as we label the stuff. As long as, well, ideally you want to label it because it will help you uh -huh. get to the correct answer. Yeah. But if, as long as you got the correct answer and you put things in the right places, mm -hmm. that's what's more important. Okay. Like in the first class today, somebody said that they got the labels right, but they put it in the wrong section, but everything balanced. And I was thinking, I don't know how that could possibly occur. But regardless, as long as everything balanced, you got the right answer, that's what's more important. Okay. So again, the labeling was more to help you than anything else, particularly if you had an unbalanced TII or TFI. Other questions? All right, statement number four was economic profit. This is based on BOY, ROIC, which was basically current year, no plat divided by last year invested capital. That would get you the various numbers. Again, to get a correct answer, you must not only have the right answer, but in all four statements, you must show the balancing top and bottom. Questions about spread or ROIC. All right, so you may not have questions, but somebody in the 11 a.m. section did, and I thought they were good questions. So we're going to go through that because I'm sure if they had questions, some of you might have questions about this. This goes to the analysis, what some of this data that you've converted means, which is really where we're getting into the content for this week because this is really the second section of your group project. First section of your group project is basically the EIC, understanding the external environment. The second section of the group project is the historical financial analysis, which come from the reorganized statements and the insights it gives us into what's going on to a company. All right, so let's talk about economic profit. So, <clears throat> how much cash, look at column C, how much cash, let me rephrase, is this company creating value? So think of these as midterm part B questions. Is this company in column C creating value in this year? Yes or no? How do you know? What number are you looking at? Spread. Spread. Very important. In this class, unlike the other classes you've taken in the Smith School, to get a correct answer on an exam, you must not only have the right answer, you must refer to a number. Right, <clears throat> because what I've learned, even when I was in your shoes taking a strategy or marketing class, is I can say the company destroyed value. I have no idea, and it's 50-50, and I'll still get credit for that. All right. Well, I'm not going to use that standard in this class. So in this class, not only must you say that the company destroyed value, you must reference that you use the number 99.8 of economic profit negative to say that the company was destroying value. Okay. So again. Standard on the exam. If you just said the company was destroying value based on the data in column C, you'd get a zero on your exam. You wouldn't get partial credit, okay? Because you could be lucky, not good, and I'm not going to grade you on 50% probabilities. So the only way that we know that you know the right answer is you said in your answer that they were destroying value because their economic profit was negative 99.8. So if we know what number you're looking at, then we actually know that you understand the concept. That is very important on every homework assignment and exam for the rest of the semester. That is the standard, okay? And it will always be applied in grading, right? So <clears throat> here's the point. Why is this company destroying value in this period of time? So economic profit is one period change in value. Why are they destroying negative 99.8 of value in 2000, whatever year this was, 2016? What's causing them to destroy value? They're borrowing at eight percent and only returning four point nine percent of the negative spread. Exactly right, <clears throat> and so that's what I want you to understand. That think of four point nine percent is like an IRR, okay? And the eight percent is the R. <clears throat> if your IRR is less than your R, you're going to have a negative spread, which means you're going to have negative NPV. That's all we're showing. It's just a one period IRR, so they have a negative spread, which is causing that. Let's say it the other way. 
What else do we know that's causing them to have a negative value in 2018? Value destruction. What else do we know? <clears throat> How much capital did the company borrow and tie up in this business? 3260. <laughs> How much do they have to earn on that capital to break even on a value basis? 8%. What is 8% of 3260 called? The capital charge. They give us a finance charge. So since the balance sheet's got a balance, if I borrowed and invested 3260 and the investors expected me to make 8% on the 3260, I need to make 260.8 to break even. How much after tax profit did they make in 2017? One sixty one. That's exactly right. So they were ninety nine point eight short of breaking even. Does everybody understand that? Questions. So here's another potential <laughs> midterm part B question. If this company were to maintain this negative spread over time, would they go bankrupt? Yes or no? If this company maintained this negative spread over time, would they go bankrupt? Yes or no? <clears throat> so in general, if you have a negative spread and stays negative over time, will you go bankrupt? Your spread never turns positive. Okay, why? Uh, well, that, I would say, assuming they don't raise outside capital, because otherwise it, all the sort of activities you do are destroying value, then you wouldn't necessarily make money. Okay, <clears throat> so you'd get 25% of the credit. You'd still lose 75% of the answer on the midterm. Okay, so here's what I want you to understand. It's a nuanced point but I'm going to try and draw it here in Excel or uh, in PowerPoint. <clears throat> See if I can do this easily. Drawing, I need a line. Two axes, x-axis, y-axis. <laughs> okay, so we have two lines. One, here, insert shape line here. Okay, this line. Uh, text box is the whack. This sack whack. This is the whack. This is the cost of debt. And over here we have the ROIC. So here's the point. If you're up here this is value creation. And if you're down here, this is value destruction. But, I'll put this just generally over here. So here's the point. This zone where you earn more than cost of debt but less than WAC is what we're going to call the house of pain. Now, 
you don't go bankrupt when you're in the house of pain. This zone, when you're below your cost of debt, is the reckoning. So this weekend, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, Halloween Horror Nights in Orlando. So I'm just getting amped up for the whole Halloween thing. Nine haunted houses, five scare zones. If you haven't been there, it's really cool. Look it up online. Anyways, <clears throat> so long story short, here's the thing. Why am I calling it the house of pain? And what I'll say is you can actually survive, but you won't go bankrupt when you're in the house of pain. How does that happen? Yeah. No, that would be the value creation. So I'm saying if you have a negative spread, there's two people you generally borrow from. Who are the two people you generally borrow from? Shareholders and banks bondholders, debt and equity. If you don't pay back the shareholders a dividend, does that lead to bankruptcy? No. If you don't pay back the bondholders an interest payment, does that lead to bankruptcy? Yes, yes it does. That's the difference. So a lot of companies can actually operate where they're paying back the debt, but they're not giving the shareholders a good rate of return. I'm not saying the shareholders don't get pissed off. They could change management. They could sell their stock in protests. Stock price will go down, but they can still go. When you can't long-term pay back the banks and the banks cut you off, then you have no choice because that puts you into default. And so that's the point. I want you, and this is subtle, but very important. A lot of people in the real world don't even understand this, is that a negative spread doesn't mean you go away, right? So think about Toys R Us. Toys R Us last week finally threw in the towel and went bankrupt. Why? Using this information as a metaphor, why do you think Toys R Us finally had to go bankrupt? RLICs at the reckoning point. Yeah, they're at the reckoning point where they can't meet the cost of debt going forward. And the suppliers and the banks figured that out. So now Toys R Us is going under. I'm going to stop giving you cash. I'm not going to ship you any stuff until you give me cash COD. You know, I don't care if it's Christmas holiday season or not. So at this point, I don't think you're even in the cost of debt, so I'm done. And at that point, Toys R Us ceased to exist. For the last several years, Toys R Us has been struggling, but they still maintain that ability to pay the cost of debt. The person that struggled is they couldn't make the shareholder returns. And what I'm telling you is you can see a lot of companies, Ford, for example, is in that situation. A lot of the automobile companies, they have a negative spread, right? Some of it's timing, but some of it could be extended. As long as you make your cost of debt, as long as you have the cash to pay that debt, excess cash and or people willing to spend, you can survive. But I'm telling you, if your stakeholders think that you can't even earn the cost of debt long term, they will stop lending to you and then you will go away. So that's going to be key to your understanding of economic profit. Is that first of all, when you look at the statement, there's a lot of data on here, but what I want you to start and end with is the spread positive or negative, right? Because that's gonna be telling. If the spread is positive, you know that that company's creating value, which means you know to be looking for a positive spread. If the economic profit is negative, you know that the company has a negative spread. And then there should be two sub-questions that come out of that. Number one, what's your view on the spread over time? Is this just a point in their investment cycle where they're doing heavy investment mode and it hasn't paid off yet? Maybe that's why it's low. Or are they really in trouble? And then the second thing is are they in the house of pain or are they at the reckoning point going forward? Because at the reckoning, then the company's in a lot of trouble. Right. So that's just sort of, if you think about it by, on a binary basis, when you look at the statement, the way I want you to start to approach this. The other thing I want you to do is go back to the CFI. This is a very important statement. I know you hated this exercise, but here's the value of the rearranged CFI. It tells you a lot about what's going on in a business. This is now mapped to the four sections of Medigliani Miller. So when you do your CFI analysis, which will be your next homework assignment, then basically you have to always talk about four sections. Number one, operating, which is free cash flow. Number two, non-operating. Number three, debt. Number four, equity. 
So what you're really trying to do is you're trying to figure out what's happening in those four sections. When you look at a CFI, the first number you should look at, just like with the EP, is free cash flow. Because that tells you almost everything you need to know about the analysis that follows. <coughs> if a company has free cash flow that's positive, what does that tell you? So 2016, positive 654. What does that tell you immediately? What do you know before looking at any other number? What do you know? I'm sorry? Exactly. They have cash. I'm just repeating it for the, we're recording this in audio. We have cash that we can distribute to the investors. So that's the point. We've generated more cash than we spent. So if you have positive free cash flow, where did it go? How did I distribute this cash to my investors? If my free cash flow is negative, like 2017, I should immediately try and figure out, okay, how did I fund that? How did I fund that loss? So that should be the first thing that you think about when you think about CFI. The second part is what drives free cash flow. It's gross cash flow minus gross investment. So what's happening with those two? To help us understand the relationship, there's something called the investment rate as a percentage or reinvestment rate, which is what percentage of the gross cash flow is put back in the business. So gross investment divided by gross cash flow. So in 2016, negative 72% reinvestment. In 2016, 2017, positive 221% reinvestment. What does that reinvestment tell me? What's going on in 2016 with this company? They're not putting money back into their investments. That's right. They're not putting money back into the business, which is why they're generating more free cash flow. So here's a rule of thumb. At a minimum, to maintain your business, you should be reinvesting depreciation. Right? If you think about the concept of depreciation, which is often straight line, the idea is if that's the life of your asset, if you're not reinvesting depreciation, then you're not going to be able to maintain what you got. So reinvestment rates consistently below depreciation suggest that either your facilities are going to get old and fall apart or you're going to shrink. The flip side is also true. If you're reinvesting a lot more than depreciation, that's a signaling effect that you expect to grow. So what's the signal in 2016? Facilities are falling apart. Yeah, because basically, how much is depreciation? And, and this is why I broke out the invested capital, how much are they reinvesting in CapEx? 20. So that's the point. Depreciation is 220, I'm only spending 20. All right, there, I'm not really trying to grow. All right, I'm, my, I'm not, I don't have any capacity to grow. Now, maybe I'm over capacity and I don't need to grow. You know, maybe I'm in a situation where I only have to build plant once every five years. And that's okay. And that's minimum maintenance. I need to understand the business. But regardless, this doesn't signal growth. Now, I made these numbers up when we did the exercise. But what if you saw this company that had a negative free cash flow because it spent 660 on CapEx? What could be the two reasons that they spent 660 and have a 221% investment rate? What would be the two reasons? Why would a company spend 220% of its cash flow on reinvestment for CapEx? Yeah. Exactly. So they're building the capacity now because they're expecting to grow, and that could be a signaling effect to grow. What's the second reason? And I'll give you a hint. Look at 2016. What happened in 2016? <coughs> we didn't spend any money. 2017, we spent a lot of money. Maybe we have to catch up. All right? But typically, this is what I mean by, okay, let's go to the next step. We've got some questions. But let's go to the next step. Where did the cash come from in 2017 to fund all that investment and to basically fill the negative 475 free cash flow gap? Did it come from non-operating activities? 
What did they do with non-operating activities in 2017? I'm now in column D. I need 475 of cash. What did I do here in the non-operating activities? What happened to my excess cash? Did I draw down my cash reserves? Ironically, I actually added more to my cash reserves even though I had negative free cash flow. I did make some investments in another business, change in equity investments. Did I sell those investments and raise cash? Or did I invest new things that took away from cash? Well, let's go back here. What happened to my equity investments? They went from 595 to 375. So that means I raised some cash by selling off my minority stakes. But even after doing that, I still was 227 short and I needed to go fund the business for 227. Where did the cash come from? How did I fund the 227? <coughs> Primarily. I borrowed 400 of long-term debt to fund the CFI, which by proxy was primarily to fund the CapEx. Now, here's what's interesting. I paid a dividend. I paid 80 in dividends. Here's a midterm question that 20% of you will miss, but I'll go ahead and give it to you right now. Could this company afford to pay its dividends? They paid 80 in preferred and common dividends. Can this company, based on 2017 data, can they afford to pay those dividends? Yes or no, and why? <coughs> That would be a midterm part B question. What do you think? Can they afford to pay those dividends? On an, I'll add the words, on an ongoing basis. Run this company steady state in 2017 going forward. Can it afford those dividends? I'm now seeing less hesitation. I'm seeing shaking of the heads. So the answer is no. Why? Because it's only paying them right now because they borrowed a lot of long-term debt and it's going to catch up eventually. So how do we know that that's going to catch up? Because, <laughs> see that number? They have negative CFI. If I have negative CFI, I don't have the cash flow to pay the dividends. How did this company pay the dividends? By borrowing. It borrowed money from preferred shareholders and long-term debt to also fund the dividends. I see that clearly here in the financials because I don't have the money to pay the dividends because I also had negative free cash flow. So that's the point. If I have negative cash flow, I'm spending more than I'm making. I can't really afford to distribute payout to shareholders because I have an investment rate above 100%. So the only way in the short term I can do that is either I draw down my excess cash, which they didn't do, or in this case, they borrowed money. And I'm telling you, as a bank, if a company keeps having negative cash flow, they can't pay me back. So even the bankers are going to look at cash flow on a go-forward basis. Yes? Reward to shareholders. That's a great question. So... <clears throat> Why might you think that a company would do that? Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. That's right. I'm making some investments for the future, and there's a signaling effect. So I'm signaling, hey, I think the future is going to work out really well. So here's some cash now. I'm so confident in the future, I'm going to give you cash now. All right. I'll give you a more sinister reason. And we're going to do it because we're about to look at Coca Cola in the real world with the same data, which is I'm not doing well but I'm going to give you cash so you think I am because I've got all this cash heading to you. Everything must be roses. <clears throat> so here's some cash to line your pocket. 
because I have confidence in my future, even if I don't. And I'll give you something more sinister. I'm going to keep buying back the stock because as a senior leader, my bonuses are tied to EPS. And I can create EPS growth on an accounting basis by reducing share count. And more sinister, by giving cash that looks good, I get a higher stock price in the short term, and my stock options are based on stock price, and I'm out of here in three years. So by the time you figure out that I can't afford this, I'm gone. Next guy will figure that one out. Yes? So why does it, why, I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm not saying in this example, I'm trying to go for complete common sense in any investing methodology. I was just randomly throwing numbers out here. But that being said, what it really says is this company basically took in 500 of cash from preferred shareholders in the banks to primarily fund two things. Fund A, the negative free cash flow, which became a negative CFI, primarily because they spent a lot on CapEx. That's the granularity of what we can see. Because I had 393, call it 400 of cash flow. I put in 870, so I had to fund the difference. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand like, the concept behind the negative. Well, the negative says, and that's the point of this statement in the TII, is if I am cash flow negative, I mean, I'm spending more, 227 more than I take in, I have to go find to fund my business, the 227, otherwise I go bankrupt. Because if I spend $227 more than I have, that $227 has to come from somewhere. Otherwise, I can't spend it. So the financing flows shows me where it came from. And so what I know is it came from two sources. Source number one, debt. Source number two, preferred stock. Here's the opposite. I had $213 of cash after spending. What did I do with it? Well, I basically this year borrowed debt. Think about that. Here's another midterm question that 20% of you will miss. In 2016, column C, did the company need to borrow, need to borrow the 160 of debt? Yes or no and why? No, because CFI is above 160. Yeah, CFI is above one. I have positive cash flow of 213. Why do I need to borrow an extra 160? I don't have to, that's discretionary. My cash flow is negative because I did a big CapEx. No longer discretionary. We I mean, could argue that the CapEx is discretionary, but that's the point. I need to borrow to fund the CapEx. I spent more than I made. Here, I didn't spend as much as I made. I have cash. So this debt doesn't make any sense on its surface. I don't have to borrow money. I'm generating a lot of cash. Why did they borrow a lot of money here? And I'll give you a hint. So they could buy back stock. That's why they did it. So here's the point. Is the business going really well in 2016? <clears throat> On the surface, not necessarily. So why am I buying back my stock? So I'm just telling you, these are the questions. They get more of the heart about what's really happening in the business than the accounting statements. Because this tells you a whole lot more about the business. Lecture note four. Let's go there. Yes. So if CFI, like it said short term debt, like they borrowed 160, but what if CFI was under 160, do they still need to borrow? Or as long as CFI is positive, they don't need to borrow? Any CFI that's positive, you don't have to borrow. Okay, any CFI that's positive. With one exception, if you have interest payments, if you have funds flow payments that you have to make, okay, that are not mm -hmm. discretionary, then your CFI has to be enough to cover those non-discretionary payments. Okay. So for example, I would actually say, if, if I looked at this data, that what's not discretionary, interest expense. It really needs to be above 44 and it needs to be above 56. And these minority payments. So add 44 and 25. All right. Now, if I consider my dividends non-discretionary, then I also have to have enough money to cover these three things. Okay. But what I'm saying is I can eliminate the dividends. I can eliminate the minority payments to the minority shareholders. I can't eliminate the interest expense without defaulting on my debt. So practically, 
It needs to be 44 and 56. That's what my CFI has to be. Otherwise, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. Does everybody see how I'm making those judgments? Because you're going to be making those judgments on the next homework assignment. That's homework five. Except, instead of doing it on some random company, we're going to do it on the real world. So, lecture note four, which is on Elms in the file section. Let's go to that. Here is the data for Coca-Cola. So this is the second section of your group projects. Section number one was the EIC. It was the external analysis. Section number two is the historical analysis of what's called the ROIC tree, which is here, and the CFI. All right. Since we're starting with CFI, or we just finished CFI, let's start with the CFI for Coke. Good term. <clears throat> You're going to create Excel models. Oh, damn it. Oh. Sorry, since I'm recording, it will cause problems with the screen to go full screen. So it's going to be kind of hard to see. So I'll try and uh, make it a little bit bigger here. All right. So after the midterm, you're going to create individually an Excel model, which will spit out CFIs and ROIC trees by default. Do a lot more stuff. But it's going to do those conversions for you. So this is an actual CFI for Coca-Cola from 2012 through 2016, where we took Coke's income statement balance sheet, real statements from Bloomberg, and converted them into real CFI. Okay, so this is where we're going with the assignments that you just did. So... There's five years of data, and then there's a total which just sums up the five years. Right? Now, when you're doing the analysis, you must do, okay. When you're doing the analysis, you must do two things. Number one, you're going to have to talk about all five years, and you're going to have to talk about the sum column, which is the total, which is what's happening over the five years. So individual years will matter in your homeworks and on your midterms, and on your final exam, and on your group projects. But for now, to keep it simple, because we're going to walk before we can run, I'm just going to look at the total count. Okay? So here's the points, what I said before. <coughs> First thing you want to look at when you do a CFI analysis is you want to start with free cash flow. Begin and end there. So let's look at the total. Did Coke have a positive free cash flow or a negative free cash flow over five years? Looking at the total. Positive. $49 billion of free cash flow over five years. Now, gross cash flow, gross investment. Look at gross cash flow, which was $46.7 billion, and look at the five-year trend. 10 2 9 7 9 3 8 6 8 7. Is that a good trend or a bad trend? Kind of concerns me a little. It's kind of a downward gross cash flow. Okay. Now, here's what's interesting. Coke generated $49 billion of free cash flow on $46 billion of gross cash flow. How does that happen? What is Coke's reinvestment rate? It's 8%. That's the average reinvestment rate right there. Which means 92% is payout, 8% is reinvestment on average over the last five years. Notice what's happened to Coke's reinvestment. 28, negative 2, 22, 7, negative 15. Look at their depreciation. 1787, look at their CapEx, negative 149. Depreciation, 1970, CapEx, 92. Depreciation, 1976, CapEx, 1642. What's going on with Coke the last three years? They stopped investing. That's why their free cash flow is growing. So their free cash flow is not growing because they're making more profits, which I like. Their free cash flow is growing because they're not reinvesting in their business. They've slowed their capital expenditures down to nothing. And it isn't just a one-year skip. They've been doing this for three years. And they've also been reducing their working capital, which suggests either not paying suppliers or reducing inventory. So... That's what's behind the increase in free cash flow of the business. It's not because they're making more profits that's driving their free cash flow. It's because they've slowed down and stopped their investing, which is driving their free cash flow higher. So 
They have $49 billion worth of cash flow. CFI is $33 billion. What did they do with the 16? What happened to the 16 billion to get from free cash flow to CFI with non-operating activities? There's two big things. What are the two big things? <coughs> what happened to their cash? Excess cash balance. No, it did not. It actually went up by $8 billion. You gotta check your signs. When you see on the CFI a negative excess cash, that means they increased their cash balance by eight billion. They also spent ten point nine billion investing in non-operating assets. So Coke has a lot of bottlers around the world. They probably made some investments in those bottlers, non-controlling interest investments. But after those investments, putting cash in their savings and investing ten point nine billion in non-operating assets. How much CFI was left over five years? Just reading numbers that are on the screen. 33.869 billion. So they have 33.869 billion of cash to distribute to the investors. Let's see where it went. 2.2 billion went to interest, makes sense. <coughs> Negative $17 billion worth of debt. So let's go back. Is that necessary or discretionary? They have $17 billion worth of debt. How much CFI do they have? They had $34 billion. Looking at any one of those five years, was their free cash flow negative? In any of the five years? In any of the five years, was their CFI negative? So why'd they borrow the debt? Section one, section two, section three, they borrowed $17 billion worth of debt. <coughs> what's section four? What's a four? Equity. They paid $27 billion of common dividends and they bought back $21 billion of common shares. <clears throat> what does 26 plus 21 add up to, approximately? 47. They gave $47 billion back to shareholders. How much cash was available to give back to shareholders? 33.9. How did they afford the stock repurchase? That's what they did the debt for. The debt was to buy back the stock. Now, we're at an all-time low of interest rates. Can't blame Coke for borrowing real cheap to give back money to shareholders. But here's the point. I make the comment of Coca-Cola. I'm buying back my stock because I have confidence in the future success of my business. My stock price is cheap. What do you think? Is this sustainable? How do you keep <clears throat> buying back the stock at this rate? What's necessary? For interest costs to be low, the share prices to be going up. What's necessary in a cash flow basis? What's necessary? In order to do that, they're cutting the Even more specifically, they need free cash flow. They need positive free cash flow of the exact amount or more to buy back the stock or pay a dividend and sustain it. And <clears throat> therefore they need the CFI to do it. So here's the point. How are they generating this free cash flow? So now what did you just say? Um, that makes me nervous. So here's the trend that I see. I see declining gross cash flows. I see they're increasing their free cash flow, not because they're making more money, but because they've stopped spending and they're borrowing money and they're using the cash from stop spending to buy back a lot of stock. How's that for confidence in the future? So that's what I'm saying. You gotta be careful what you hear in other classes and the propaganda that's used in the finance community that is completely misused when I buy stock because I have confidence in my future. No, Coke is doing the opposite. Coke is worried about their future. We can see that three years ago, they knew they had a sugar problem. 
<clears throat> hindsight's 2020, but sales were starting to slow down. They stopped spending on investment, but they were propping up their share price despite the worsening gross cash flow and the lack of reinvestment by giving back a bunch of money to shareholders. But I'm telling you, if I'm a sophisticated investor, I'll take that cash, but I'm not going to be excited about Coke in the future. I'm going to take that cash. I'm going to go find another company to invest because I'm starting to worry about their future. <clears throat> and by the way, again, hindsight's 2020. But look at Bloomberg today, KO US equity. And look at the EEO screen. <clears throat> Last year, Coke's revenue, 42 billion actual. This year, 35 billion. Next year, 31 billion. See, if you were a good analyst, you would have saw the smoke signals two years ago. Because when the company slashed its CapEx to next to nothing and stopped investing in its future, you would have started to wonder why. What I'm telling you is Coke knew it was having challenges selling its business. And they had started to prepare for the slowdown. Now, I'll give them credit that they were proactively doing things, but that's not what they were saying to the market at the time. They were saying, oh, look at us investing in the future. Look at all the cash that we're buying back. But is this really sustainable? And what's really behind this? The story's a lot more dismal than it looks. So I'm telling you, I'd rather have the cash than wasting the cash. But you got to be careful when people use these random marketing terms like, I have confidence in my future. If Coke really had confidence in their future, they'd be investing in CapEx to grow their sales and make more profits. That's confidence in my future. If I'm giving you money, all right, if I'm growing the business, growing the pie and giving you a share of it and making more of it, okay, that's confidence in the future. But Coke is taking a shrinking pie and they're finding ways to get more cash out of it. I don't see that as a sustainable future. I'm not saying they're not giving a lot of cash right now. This is why I go back to how sustainable is what they're doing. Statement number two. And I'll go through this more quickly just because we're running out of time. Yes. If you, if you know your future is bad, why would you want to buy back stock? Because you know your uh, stock price is going to decrease. Well, the short answer is, <clears throat> if you're honest with yourself, and I really don't have a good use for money in the future, I'm better off giving you that money than destroying value. Well, buying buying it back isn't the same thing as giving it back, is it? It is. It's a return of cash to the shareholders. Okay. It's more tax efficient than a dividend, but you're still giving cash back. And we know from the key value drivers. When you grow, reinvest, a negative spread, it gets worse. So you're avoiding that negative spread growth, you're buying it back. That's what you're doing. Now, in the real world, three things matter. There's the signaling effect, which actually has no impact on the real financials of the company, but people signal that buying back stocks, and we've convinced ourselves that buying back stocks means the future must be better. That doesn't always work out. Coke's a good example of that. Number two, bonuses. Bonuses are tied to EPS. Buying back stock manipulates EPS. If I'm in a declining business, buying back my stock increases the EPS by decreasing the share count for the same amount of earnings, and therefore my EPS looks like it's going up even if the business is less profitable. Apple's doing the same thing right now with their iPhones. All right. Third, <clears throat> stock options. By having a higher share price, because again, lower share count for same value, I get my stock options in the positive territory. And I'm telling you, that more than anything else is driving the stock repurchase and the happy talk of the future. Because I want you to realize the future is better because I'm not going to be here in five years when you figure out what's really going on. And I'm going to cash in my $50 million worth of stock options as a CEO or CFO long before you figured out we're in trouble. And I'm just telling you, sometimes companies are actually doing it and they are doing better. But that's the point. We need to really understand what's going on. The CFI and the ROIC gives us a lot more insight than what you're going to get from the company itself. This is the advantage of the analytics. ROIC tree. Second <coughs> statement. There are three things that drive ROIC. Always three things. When you explain the changes in ROIC, you will always talk about these three things. EOY stands for end of year. For simplicity, for your next homework assignment, you're going to primarily talk about the last five years and the change over the five years. Therefore, change between 2012 and 2016. In 2012, Coke's end-of-year ROIC was 17.8%. In 
In 2016, it was 20.5%. Is that better or worse than five years ago? Did their ROIC go up or down? 17.8 to 20.5. Went up. ROIC is better. Matter of fact, it went up by 15.1%. Three things, always three things, determine your ROIC. One, your tax rate. In 2012, they paid 23.1% on taxes of revenue. In 2016, they paid 19.5% tax rate. Sorry, of earnings. That's of earnings. 23% tax rate versus today, 19.5% tax rate. Does that tax rate change help or hurt the ROIC? It helps because you get taxed less. Exactly. So that's the point. Your answer would be that I'm paying 19.5% in taxes versus 23 23.1% in taxes. So that 15.5% decline in taxes help my ROIC. So here's the thing. If we take out the impact of taxes, we have a pre-tax ROIC the actual operations of Coke. The operations of Coke went from a 23% pre-tax ROIC to a 25.4% pre-tax ROIC. So even though taxes helped them, the actual underlying business of Coke improved. ROIC, operating pre-tax ROIC improved. Everybody see that? All right, this leads to two and three. Operating margin, which is EBIT divided by sales or operating profit divided by sales, times productivity, invested capital divided by sales, equals pre-tax ROIC. These two things have equal weight and multiplication in driving this. Income statement, balance sheet. Start with the income statement. Their pre-tax margin went from 22.4 to 20.6. Does that help or hurt their ROIC? It hurt their ROIC. They had a decline in margin of 8%, and they went from 22.4 cents to 20.6 cents. Their productivity, invested capital over sales. In 2012, to generate a dollar of sales, they invested 97.1 cents. To sell the same dollar of sales in 2016, they only have to invest 81 cents. Is that better or worse? I had to spend 97 cents five years ago to sell the same thing that I spend 83 cents today. Is that better? Coke improved its productivity. So here's the thing. They had declines in margins, but they offset it with big improvements in productivity. And their productivity, their balance sheet productivity, increased faster, which gave them a better ROIC. So those three things always explain your ROIC. Here's the second level analysis. The income statement is behind the operating margin. What happened, again, I'll make it a little bit bigger. What happened to the operating margin? Well, it went down. Why? Gross margin, 64.4 to 64.9, stayed the same. SG&A, 37.9 to 40. Well, that went up. <clears throat> Depreciation, 4.1 to 4.3. Which of the three income statement drivers hurt their operating margin? It was the increase in SGNA. By the way, selling general administrative. What do you think Coke, if you had to guess, spent the most money on in increasing their SGNA? Marketing. Marketing. Drink more soda. But here's the problem. People aren't drinking more soda because they're worried about the sugar content. So they spent a lot of marketing, but they didn't get the sales lift. Well, that should normally hurt your productivity, but what happened here? Operating working capital went from 10 cents to 0.05 cents, to 5 cents. PP&E went from 30 cents to 25 cents, and acquisitions went from 57 to 50. Why did PP&E get so much more productive? Because normally that would be a good thing. But we just did a CFI analysis. Why do you think they're getting better PP&E to sales? Lower is better. Assets are decreasing. Why? They're not spending anything on CapEx. That's the point. The reason the productivity of Coke is actually increasing 
and we can see it right here, is because basically they're not reinvesting in their business. See, it'd be one thing if they spent on CapEx and then they got a huge sales lift. They're generating cash flow because they're not spending even depreciation on their business, and that's giving them cash flow. It makes their ROIC better, which is hiding the fact that their margins are worsening, and they're doing it because they're slashing their business faster than their margins are worsening. But long term, there's only so many assets they're going to be able to sell, and the real problem at Coke is the declining margins, which are the declining no plats, which are the declining gross cash flows, and no amount of stock buyback is going to hide that long term. And I'm telling you, this is what you should see when you analyze a company. Now, real quick, the other two companies on here are Nokia and Ericsson. If you're not familiar with them, those are two of the three largest back-end providers of networking equipment to cell phone companies. So their big customers would be Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, AT&T. And the big thing right now is 5G. Okay, which is basically take your 4G phone speed, multiply it by 10 to 100, that's 5G. But here's the thing. If we did an EIC, what we would see, and I'll use AT&T as an example, is that the spread of their customers today is pretty lousy. It's close to zero. Why is a network operator, when I want to spend tens of billions of dollars to go to the next big speed thing, if I'm not making money on 4G? So here's the thing. One of the big questions is what happens in 2018, 2019? Like, are they going to jump to 5G in the next two years? And the answer is probably not, because it doesn't make sense to lose value because I haven't fully monetized my other network. And so here's the thing. If you see what's happened to Nokia... If you do the analysis real quick, I'll just highlight it. You will see a big drop in 2016 operating margin for Ericsson and a big drop in ROIC and a big drop for Nokia because basically the carriers are not buying their 5G equipment that they've spent money on and they're deferring the expansions. And what I'm telling you is you can see this happening on the ROIC trees and the CFIs. So, for Wednesday, there is no lecture. In lieu of a lecture, you're going to be basically doing this type of analysis on a real-world company, as I have done. I have been recording this. I'm going to post the recording. And essentially, you're going to have to basically do these analysis, write it up, and turn it in. Individual assignment, practice. Right? Next Monday, we'll cover this in class in lieu of the midterm. So we will have a lecture next Monday right? with the following caveat. Um, I am doing Halloween Horror Nights this weekend, and I fly back Monday morning. So not that it should affect the flights, because I should be back around 10 o'clock, but if there is a problem, I'm not going to stay in Orlando, but nonetheless, uh, assuming that my flight gets back on time, we'll have a normal lecture on Monday. Yes? When are you posting? When am I posting what? Probably tomorrow. Homework 5 should be posted tomorrow. And homework 5 will be Monday? Homework 5 is going to be due Monday. No lecture on Wednesday. Time in class to work on homework 5. Well, our next lecture will be a week from today on October 2nd. Okay, have a good week.